All right, guys. Well, my name is Jace, and I'm the kids pastor here at Calvary Christian Assembly in Seattle. Uh, and I'm excited to talk with you about uh, children's ministry versus family ministry. Uh, it's a topic that I'm really passionate about. It's something that uh, I really think is uh, a conversation that needs to be taking place within children's ministry. And I think to get the best context uh, before we make a decision on what's better or which we should do or, or, or what's um, you know what should be the bigger focus is we need to talk a little bit about uh, the history of kids ministry and where we've come from and I think that when you study history it helps you understand where you're at and gives you instruction on kind of where to go forward so we're going to talk about that uh, just a little bit today and then hopefully we'll do uh, some so we'll have some time to do a little bit of a Q&A at the end uh, or um, someone was saying you should yeah it doesn't matter we're talking about Q&A's and you should crush crushing the questions it kind of rhymes a little bit. And I was like, oh, that's witty. I'm going to use that. But I totally ruined it just now. Uh, so we're just going to go forward. But um, I think all of us know that how the church has accomplished her mission has continued her to require to pivot in response to culture um, as the needs of people change. Uh, so should we adapt how we approach equipping the saints in order to position ourselves for the best impact. And so when we look back... Uh, in the 1780s or even before the 1780s uh, the development of the roads uh, the advent of the New Testament is one of the things that allowed missionaries to even go out from Rome the peace of Rome allowed it to be a safe place for missionaries to go out and spread the gospel uh, when the Gutenberg press was invented that's when we had this new technology right where we can make something called the Bible for people to hand out for folks to read uh, with their communities and uh, I don't know how many of you guys knew this. This is a, a fun story, but uh, the invention of the light bulb, when it came out, it was this crazy new technology. Beforehand, you'd have to work until the sun went down, and then once the sun went down, you had to, you had to stop working because you couldn't hardly see anything. Maybe you could light some candles or something, but this thing came out called electricity and light bulbs, and when light bulbs came out, you could do things at night. And everyone wanted to be around light bulbs because it's this new cool thing. It's kind of like uh, when, when the neighbor gets the, the big screen curved TV 3D and you want to watch the NFL game. I don't know if you guys relate to that. But like people in the neighborhood, they're like, I'll come over. I'll bring the ribs. <laughs> but when the light, te light bulb technology came out, churches were like, we could really leverage this technology by wiring our churches for electricity. And we could have evening services. And so you had all these towns filled with people who just wanted to go like do things at night. And where was the thing, a place that you could go to do a thing? You could go to church because they had light bulbs, they had electricity. And so it was this really radical way that churches leverage technology in order to connect and impact people around them. Uh, in the 1780s, uh, Sunday schools began. Uh, Sunday school was birthed out of the Industrial Revolution uh, when a lot of kids were uh, putting in a lot of work weeks. Uh, there wasn't the child labor laws that we, we deal with today, and so kids were working a lot, of, uh, a lot of their week, and so they were battling illiteracy uh, all across the world. And actually, um, the first Sunday schools came out of Britain, and, and they were specifically um, created to combat childhood illiteracy. And as it became more popular, uh, it became kind of a bigger thing, and it crossed over into America on the East Coast and then spread west. And not everybody liked Sunday school when it was invented. The concept of Sunday school that kids would learn, uh, with, even with the Bible as their textbook, was something that was very controversial to the Puritans especially initially because they felt like that was doing work on the Sabbath. And so you need to separate your work from the Sabbath. Sunday school shouldn't be a thing. We all know who won that battle, right? Many of us, uh, we still have Sunday school in our, in our churches today, but um, as times progressed and we've learned uh, new ways in how to interact with kids, the um, Sunday school has transitioned to more uh, of a kids' church environment, right? And, and so some of those technologies that, that developed in the Sunday school era is uh, Sunday school songs, right? So the wise man built his house upon the rock, the wise man. Those were Sunday school songs that were built to, to help kids learn the Bible and understand what they were trying to read. Uh, flannel graphs became a big deal. And, and listen, like I know it's kind of popular and fun to laugh about flannel graphs, but fl if you go into a twos and three year old class with an armful of flannel graphs, they will love you forever. Yes. It's 2015, 
but but that's still uh, something that the the tactile feel, the the look of like pictures coming to life in front of them. Kids still love flannel graphs. It was a big innovation when that came out. Uh, and then activity sheets. We've all used activity sheets, crosswords, uh, word finders, mazes, uh, coloring sheets, things to really um, engage kids at different levels as we learn the different ways that kids learn, right? Uh, once kids' church became a, a deal and, and Sunday school kind of transitioned from this thing that happened in a separate uh, hour from big people's church, uh, it actually, kids' church became this thing that happened the entire service. So adults, uh, and that's kind of the format that we have today, right, in, in a lot of our churches. Adults go to their service, kids get dropped off in their service, and we've continued to, to develop new technologies and new uh, ways of engaging that culture because we really, as kids pastors, as kids leaders, as people who want to impact the generation for Christ, we're always pursuing the newest technologies, the newest methods, the newest strategies that allow us to, to reach into a kid's life in a way that hopefully allows um, them to pay attention to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus listening or speaking into their ear and, uh, and giving them hope and, and pointing to their need for him. And so it's, it, there's nothing wrong with doing these things. Uh, we've seen the advent uh, in the last 30 to 40 years of, of kids and student Bibles. That's a newer technology. Uh, digital media is, is the big things come up in probably the last 15 to 20 years. So things like PowerPoint, ProPresenter, <laughs> videos, lights, audio. Uh, the newer thing now in the last five years are the idea of, of web learning tools. So kids can learn something at home or at church and then they go home and there's a website that they can log into where they can play activities, games, or maybe send little messages to their friends from church. And, and these are all uh, great tools. And we shouldn't judge the evolution of technology. Uh, everything that, that we've listed, everything that we've used throughout the year, they are viable and we should fully exploit any resource available to us short of sin to impact emerging generations for Christ. Um, for example, the iPhone app, uh, how many of you guys have used the, the YouVersion Kids Bible uh, on, your, on your phone or on your, your tablet? It is just as viable of a resource as flannel graphs have ever been. It's just a tool that we can leverage to reach kids. However, uh, the negative impact of the continued evolution of kids' ministry and our worthy pursuit of the best ways to impact children has made parents increasingly comfortable with placing the responsibility of discipling their children on the shoulders of the church. This has never been the biblical model for spiritual development of children. Uh, in fact, uh, researchers like Christian Smith, Walt Mueller, and George Barna uh, have all suggested that program-driven ministries do not produce Christians who live according to a biblical worldview. Uh, in the pursuit of presenting excellent ministry for kids, we can run the risk of empowering parents to lose sight of Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. And I put that verse uh, on your handout, uh, but um, it says, You should love him, your true God, with all your heart and soul, with every ounce of your strength. Make the things I'm commanding you today part of who you are. Repeat them to your children. Talk to them when you're sitting together in your home and when you're walking together down the road. Make them the last thing you talk about before you go to bed and the first thing you talk about the next morning. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. So a biblical worldview of discipleship of children must include the family. And that's the first blank on your sheet. I don't think anyone here disagrees with this. I don't think I'd get in an argument with any one of you. None of you are going to say, no, Jace, I don't think parents matter. I just don't think they matter. We all already agree with that. We're already there, right? Most of us agree that parents should be the primary pastors in the lives of their children. And I, that's strong language, right? We, we have this, this sacred concept of pastors, to be a pastor. But, but the reality is, who is, does a better job of shepherding and leading their kids than their parents? Parents should be the primary pastor in their kids' lives. And that the home should be the primary place of spiritual development for the family. So recognizing that, recognizing that, that we've created this culture now in churches where parents believe that they can just drop their kids off and we're going to take care of them. I'll, I'll bring them to Sunday school, I'll bring them to kids' church, and they're going to learn the Ten Commandments, and they're going to learn uh, you know, about how to behave, they're going to learn about you know, the Bible verse of the month, and that way when I get home, I feel good that my kids are being raised with a Christian worldview. But we know that's not what's happening. 
we know that uh, the, the generations, that emerging generations are going to church less than ever before. We know, uh, at least in our context, in this American context, right? We know that there needs to be a change. And so like we talked about earlier, healthy churches recognize culture and pivots to pursue maximum impact, which is why the practice of family ministry began to rise in popularity in recent years. Uh, uh, the first time I was became familiar with the concept of family ministry was about 2010. That's when a lot of the research, especially by George Barna, was coming out about uh, kind of the context that we were sitting in as American Christians and how that engage how we engaged uh, families and kids. So um, here's a couple things that we can do to to look at uh, the kind of how to engage at least the concept of uh, a family ministry. The first thing we need to do is we need to be strategic in how we win families. We need to recognize that the family calendar is incredibly busy. Perhaps not as busy as during the Industrial Revolution, but school, work, after school activities, sports, homework, date nights for the parents, and, and just general life shortens the availability of families. And I've had a conversation with some of you guys even in this room, and I know you feel that. I know you're, you're in these situations. I feel the, 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 the pressure too that, um, man, these really great programs that we've put together, the kids uh, aren't coming to as many of them. It's not that they're not excited about it. We talk to them about it and they're like, oh, I love that idea. I, w I want to do that. I love, you know, whatever, whatever program that is. I don't want to pick out anything specific. But when the program comes, oh, they have soccer practice or um, mom and dad can't drive them here and they can't get a ride with someone and they're not gonna take the city bus because they're four years old. And, and so we need to recognize, uh, and, and you can decide whether or not you wanna combat that cultural um, evolution that, that the family unit has become so busy or whether or not you wanna find ways to engage and interact and redeem that. Uh, oftentimes, an addition of programming can be viewed by families as just another commitment. So church events become something that competes with soccer practice, date night, et cetera, right? And so um, the answer to engaging the family isn't necessarily through adding more programs. Embrace the outcome of a busy life creates, oh, you should embrace that the outcome of a busy life creates families who crave connectivity with each other. So these are just some tips that um, as we look at how we engage family, because the, the honest answer is there's no easy solution to any of this. And this is something we're constantly gonna be having a conversation about and constantly finding ways to interact with it. But these are things that we should recognize and they should light the path on how we do kids ministry. But they do view uh, additional programs as just one more commitment. Uh, but they do crave that connectivity with each other because they're so busy, because their kids are busy, because the parents are busy. The, the, the opportunities to spend to get time together as a family unit is valuable to most families. And I think we feel that, I think we recognize that, we know that. Uh, those of us who, ha who still have um, young kids at home, and, and we know that even in our busy life that, that man, I just wanna have more time with my kids. And, and it's tough to do that sometimes. Uh, especially, especially when you're the guy or the girl who's leading the kids programs at church, and your kids can even be there uh, it doesn't you don't necessarily feel that connection. Um, <clears throat> so the way that we can interact with that is we can look at ways to implement opportunities for families to spend time together as a unit. Bonus points if those opportunities can happen during the existing church schedule. So not looking to add an additional thing on a Wednesday night or a Friday night or a Saturday morning. Uh, th those things can be good and those things can be helpful and, and I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm just saying if you can find ways to, for those intentional interactions to take place within the context of the ministry calendar you already have, you're gonna find big wins there. Try to include parents on important milestones in their kids' spiritual walk. So an example of this that comes to my head right away is, is baptism. I love the idea, and some churches can do this, not all churches can do this, but I love the idea of inviting the parents into the baptismal tank 
to baptize their kids. I love that idea. It shows ownership. It, it, it shows that deep spiritual connection where parents really are the primary pastors of their kids' lives. Um, but that's just one way, that's one type of milestone that you can include parents in on. Bring the siblings along. Uh, lean heavy into student leadership. And I would say go radical into student leadership. Um, no kid is too young to begin to build character and to begin to build um, the, the practices and the methods that will carry them farther and reach richer and deeper as they grow older. Always innovate. So here are some uh, examples or ways, uh, things that we're looking at doing even in our church potentially in the next year to really embrace the concept of family ministry. So um, we're talking about implementing a couple times a year family services within our kids' ministry. Um, the way that that looks uh, may be a little bit different than, than some of you think when you think of the idea of a family service. Oftentimes, I don't know about you guys, but I think of a family service and I think of... Um, having an, a, a service upstairs in the adult area that's kind of uh, uh, kitted down a little bit. Maybe having, some, sometimes there's like a kid's sermon in the beginning or a puppet show or a special song or video to really uh, kind of get the kid's attention. And then the pastor, whoever's preaching, whether that's you or the lead pastor or a different pastor, uh, tries to, to teach a message that um, you hope that the kids are able to pull something from. But, but here's how that feels to me when I think about that. When I... Bring, so I'm, I'm like a huge nerd. I just I am. And I was born that way, and I don't apologize for it, but I was fed as a young child uh, the bottle of Star Wars, Star Trek, and, and just the nerdiest, geekiest things you could ever imagine. I cried when the Star Wars trailer came out. You guys, I'm not joking. <laughs> like The trailer played, and Han Solo comes in the end. He's like, Chewie, we're home. And, and I was driving when it was happening. This is, I don't recommend you do it. I'm driving, and, and I knew the trailer was going to be getting released at a certain time, so I'm like waiting for it, and it starts playing, and, I'm, I'm, and it's going, and all of a sudden I feel like the tears come in. I had to pull off to the side of the road <laughs> to finish watching the trailer, and then wipe the tears from my eyes, and then get back to work. That's a true story. That was, that's me, all right? But um, I have two girls, and uh, I have a, a five-year-old, and I have a nine-year-old, and uh, they, they, there were times as they were growing up that I was trying to introduce them to these concepts, these ideas, these, these media forms I was really excited about. I'm like, oh, you want to watch Star Wars with Dad? Because I remember watching Star Wars with my dad. And they're like, oh, Dad, do we have to? Now, now I'm reaching a turning point now with my oldest. We actually, this last, to gear up for the new Star Wars movie, um, we took a month, and over the course of a month, each week, um, a little bit less than a week, we watched each Star Wars movie together, just a portion at a time before she went to bed, and she's so excited about it. She came up to me a couple weeks ago. She's like, Dad, Dad, can I go to the midnight opening with you? I just don't wait. I don't want to have to wait any more than I have to. And I cried again. <laughs> I was like, yes, dear, I'll get an extra ticket. So I'm taking her to Star Wars on December 17th. And my whole point of this is that if you rush kids into an environment that they're not ready to, to interact with yet, if you bring oftentimes your kids, and many of you may, may rec uh, uh, relate to this, you try to bring your kids to an adult movie, uh, man, adult movies are a really bad term to use. Uh, a grown-up movie, um, they, they, they don't always really connect with it, right? They don't. It's not really the exciting thing for them. Though they might tolerate it. They might put up with it, but they're not really deeply engaged. So the contrast of that, when I take my kids to Disney movies, I love it, right? I was singing Let It Go for weeks. You guys don't even know. My, my kids um, in, on our Wednesday night program were getting mad at me because I would just, I'd be teaching and then they weren't paying attention and I'd, I'd wait, I'd be real quiet and then I'd just, do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> like, no, Pastor Jace, no, not again. Um, but yeah, isn't that right? I mean, that's why Veggie Tales became such a big deal. Uh, when, when that was first coming out was that it was this thing that you could watch with your kids and there was a brilliance to it, right? That kids loved it, but it engaged parents too. And so what I recommend churches explore, and you have to have this conversation with your lead pastor, is, is the idea of creating a family service in your kids' environments that you invite your parents to. That you find a way to still be unashamedly kids 
but find ways to weave in those brilliant elements that parents can relate to because they just want to see what their kids are going through anyway. They want to see the path. They want to see how you're getting there. And so throwing them a bone a little bit here and there with, with stuff that they can interact with and have fun and, and that looks different in different places is something that I really encourage you guys to do. It's a wild experiment. Going into your lead pastor's office and be like, I have this idea. But this is what's going to happen. There's going to be, if you, if we do this, a couple of Sundays where you're going to be preaching and there's going to be no parents in the, in the congregation at all. Because they're all going to be downstairs with their kids as a family engaging and interacting with how we do ministry and the kids' ministry. And that can build excitement. And, 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 uh, but you have to make sure the entire team's on board. It's a whole team effort and, and it's worth the time, worth the energy, worth the effort. But that's just, that's an innovative idea. It may be terrible. I'll tell you guys a year from now if we get to try it, right? Um, here's another idea. Uh, kids, like I, I touched on this earlier, kids are never too young to lead. Develop character as young as possible. And, and, and that means, like, I, I make sure that our fifth graders, our fourth and fifth graders, by the time they get up to that age, they're already serving in some capacity in our kids' ministry. So that way when they go up to the youth group, I already have them on a serving schedule for when they come down. They're sixth graders, and I, I got them on the schedule once a month helping out in, in the in the preschool. I don't have them help out in elementary. That's where they'd want to help out because they'd want to be back with their friends. But you have to mind the gap, right? You have to make sure that you create space for them to become their own identity, right? So they just don't become like the big kid uh, who's still hanging out in kids' church. And then as they get into kind of their high school age, then we invite them into the elementary uh, context. But I would I would challenge you to even experiment with taking some of your, maybe your, some of your third and fourth graders and have them be junior leaders in your preschool area, right? Have some of your preschoolers help out by leading a song or, or by being in charge of snacks. Just simple things like that because kids crave responsibility. They live in a world where people are always telling them they're not old enough to do the stuff that they can do. But that's just that's just the facts. That's the reality. So if you give them things that they can cling to, they're going to love you for it. They're going to love what they're going to do, and they're going to show up ready to do more. And that's just the way it's going to work. And so recognize that you're never too young to develop that character. Another idea uh, is the idea of drop-in parent praxis. And so what I mean when I say that is creating opportunities in your service schedule where parents can drop in and, and maybe lead in an activity, whether it's a craft or a Bible study or something in your service where they're actively practicing the type of behaviors that you would prefer for them to also do in the home with their family, right? If they come in and they lead a small group discussion and their kid doesn't have to be in the small group, but their kid can't totally be in their small group and they lead in that small group discussion, they're gonna know what to do when they get home and they need to do a Bible study with their kids. So drop in parent practice. And it can only be, like, you can make it just like a 15 minute thing. Hey, can you, can you just stop in at about this time on a Sunday, maybe once a month, maybe once every couple months, just to get them kind of in that familiarity with ministering in the context of kids. Uh, but another big thing is, is always share your goals with your parents. Uh, like I said earlier, parents love it when they know where you're going. They love it uh, when they know the destination, how you're going to get there, what your methods are. Because sometimes it, I feel, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm the only man in the room here who feels this way, but I feel like we have things figured out and we've communicated clearly. And, and if you just have common sense, you know we're doing these things because we want these outcomes, right? Until that time you have a conversation with the parent. And they're like, oh, I really like this. Why do you guys do this? And you're like, oh, we do this because it leads to this, because it leads to this, because it creates this type of a Christian. And they're like, oh, wow, you guys really thought about this. You guys really care about my, I love that idea. How can I help? So always bring parents along for the ride. Um, and, and never, uh, it, it's almost impossible to overshare uh, with parents if they show interest. Uh, some parents just want to know that you love Jesus and you're going to teach their kids to love Jesus. And so you have to bring them along slowly. But you're discipling and you're developing the parents as you're discipling and developing the kids. So um, the three big points that we'll close this out on before we do um, some conversation is uh, don't abandon children's ministry. Uh, because the trick is, is that it's not children's versus family ministry. You can't have an effective family ministry if you don't have a rock star children's ministry. 
You have to do both. And you, if you have a rock star children's ministry, but you're not doing family ministry, you're not, I would challenge you to say you're not as effectively doing your job as, as you could be, um, or even your calling. Because that's our goal, is, is to create disciples with longevity, right? It's not how you start, it's how you finish. And the, the, the constant modifier in that equation is going to be their parents. So don't abandon children's <coughs> ministry. Use family ministry as a lens. So family ministry drives the vision. Family ministry uh, uh, leads the cart. And, and you allow that to contextualize what kind of programs you allow yourself to do. Be stingy with the program. Say no to things that, that are going to interrupt with the context that you're in, with family schedules, with... Um, the type of things that they like doing like I, I have a, t a ton of I mean this is Seattle so I have a ton of nerdy people uh, of parents who come here like we do big events we did um, just last Sunday we did a bridge event to our trunk or treat called intergalactic Sunday we rented a Darth Vader costume we had a guy dress up in it we did a photo booth we I'm had laser sure lights I'm not sure what you said either that was Siri for the microphone someone's Siri went off I'm not I'm not saying who during here um, <laughs> But uh, we had, no joke, parents who weren't even involved in the kids' ministry show up, st full Star Trek uniform. I mean, they just did. And that's, a, that, that's just, that's our culture. That's, that's who we are. Um, but so because of that, we know that we can do really fun events like uh, Family Board Game Day. And we're going to have a ton of people come out. And they're going to bring snacks. It's like, it's like, I feel like it's the bigger, better potluck. Like, do the potluck, but also do board games, right? And... Uh, so that's something that would work well in my context, may not work as well in like Yelm, I don't know. Uh, it just kind of, you understand your culture. But use family ministry as a lens, and then when choosing between children and family ministry, choose both, choose both. And I think you guys kind of saw where we were going at with there. Uh, but that is, uh, yeah, there is actually, if you guys pick up the new Fusion book, um, Kate from uh, Creekside, she's the family life pastor over there, she wrote a chapter on this exact topic, and we kind of land in the same place. She explains it way better than I do, probably, because uh, she does it in like two pages. But uh, but I definitely recommend you guys give this a read, and and yeah, uh, it's a really good chapter. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the book in general. Um, I hope you guys get a chance to check it out. But I don't know if you guys want to talk about some stuff, or you have some questions. We can crush and do some crushing the questions. Let's crush the questions. All right, anyway, what do you guys got? Yeah. I'm sure here in Seattle, you guys kind of get the same thing. Mm -hmm. How do you go about? Uh, and so one of the things that I get, I get, I'll get a phone call from a parent that I call. My kid just told me that I'm not so, supposed to smoke or do all these other things. So, and it's like I don't want my child telling me that. <clears throat> so it, it sometimes comes into a hard thing is we're trying to teach them. They're going to go home, and then you know some of those parents don't want to be told that they're living the wrong way. Totally. How do How do you combat that? Yeah, so I think that depends a lot on your context. That's a great question, by the way. Uh, I think it depends a lot on your context. Uh, I think it depends a lot on, on your church, and it also depends um, a lot on your own personal convictions, right? And so I started that question when I started here at CCA, uh, where we had people, our midweek program was essentially being used as childcare for some folks. And I'd ask myself, do, is that a culture that I want to combat? Do I want to fight that and tell parents, hey, you know, if you're going to drop your kids off, you need to go into an adult program too and, and, and do that sort of thing? Or do I want to embrace that and take advantage of the opportunities that God's created uh, to really impact these kids' lives? And, and, and encourage parents, hey, if you need to go out on a date night, drop your kids off on Wednesday. If you need to go run groceries, run errands, drop your kids off on a Wednesday. We'll take your kids. We love them. And it'll be a safe place. They're all background checked. Uh, it's going to be a, a great environment. They're going to want to come back next week. Uh, and so that's the first step, right, is, is, is seeing those things. Like, is that something you want to, you want to try to find opportunities to really bridge the parents in and everything. Um, the other thing is, and I'm just going to be, like, super-duper honest, and this is our culture, this is our context, uh, but I'm 100% I'm on board with, with what Verlin Fosner was speaking about a couple days ago. I don't spend a lot of time in my, in my context telling my kids, specific behaviors that they should and shouldn't do. And I definitely don't tell them to go into their context and tell their parents, their friends, that they should and shouldn't do. So I'll never tell a kid uh, in a church context that, um, 
that it's a sin to smoke a cigarette. And I don't know if any of us would like necessarily agree with that anyway, but I don't, I just wouldn't even bring up cigarettes. I'm just not going to talk about, it. I'm not going to talk about drinking. Uh, uh, but, but I am going to sometimes have kids who approach me and ask me about their parents yeah. who smoke yeah, and their I, parents who drink. Absolutely. Well, my dad does this for him, does that, and it's really hard to... And so what I would do, uh, in, 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 and what I have done in response to those types of con uh, con or, uh, conversations is I, I spend a lot of time talking about the grace of God. And, and, and um, I mean, I can relate to some of that. I, drove, I was in the Marine Corps for four years, and I was smoking like two packs of cigarettes a day. And I just didn't care. I was drinking, and and God had to deliver me, especially from the cigarettes, because cigarettes is like such an addictive thing. I don't know if that's like a really safe thing to say, but hey, we all love each other, so I'm just I'm just being honest with you guys. Um, and, and so I I I relate to to the that kid's struggle, and I relate um, to kind of what they're going through, and this the understanding that it's not healthy, uh, and, and I just. Yeah, I just preach grace and, and, and love and mercy and, and tell them the best thing that they can do is is be a great kid um, and listen and obey their parents and honor them like the Bible says. And, and unless the, the parents encourage them to do something that's not healthy uh, or, or endangers their safety. And um, I really lean heavy into it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of what they're doing wrong. And, and I talk and I tell the kids that I'm like, you know, if you pray for your kids continually and God's Holy Spirit is going to continue to pursue them, and at some point, they're when they're ready, and when God knows that they're ready, uh, they're gonna they're gonna um, if they're going to be obedient and respond correctly to God, they're going to they're going to put that stuff aside. But what you need to focus on as a kid is be a great kid, love your parents, uh, listen to them, uh, and uh, and continue to pray for them, and I'll pray with them. So so that's what I do. Um, some kids are still going to run at home and be like. Pastor Johnny told me you need to stop smoking, so I threw them all in the cigarette or in the toilet and flushed them. <laughs> that would be bad, but you just have follow-up conversations, I guess. I don't know if that's a really good answer. Um, it answers but, quite a bit. Like I said, it's not like looking for a fight with a parent. You yeah, know, definitely. Kids will go home after being convicted over something and be like, come on, Dad, you shouldn't do this. Yeah, definitely. And then if you have the conversation with the parent once they call you, just say, hey, here's the deal. I didn't tell your kids to do that. And that's usually what happens is it's out of context. Yeah. Like, oh, no, I didn't, yeah. I didn't tell your kids to do that. Um, kids are worried. But your kids are worried about you, and they yeah. love you, <laughs> and, and they just want the best for you. And listen, let's be real. You know smoking's not healthy, right? Um, because zero out of zero or out of a thousand doctors say smoking's healthy, and they're just concerned about your health. Um, but they're not getting their, their attitude from me, I guess. Or your kid's just naturally sassy. I think one of the things that question so our our the way we do parent meetings is something that we're having a lot of conversation about internally uh, right now with my lead team and uh, because because uh, maybe you're running up against some of the same stuff or maybe again I'm the only guy in the world dealing with this but um, <laughs> but uh, parents don't necessarily want to come to parent meetings unless they feel like their time spent is incredibly valuable uh, in this world where again families are very busy the highest priority is placed on the expenditure of time and so I try, I screw this up so much, but I try so hard to prioritize um, the expenditure of time of all my volunteers, of all my leaders, uh, of, of all my um, parents, because I don't want to ask them to do things that they're gonna walk away and be like, oh, that was a waste. Uh, and that's hard to do because there's so many pressures because not only are you trying to get your stuff done, but you have people saying, hey, we should do this program and we should do this program and you need to meet with the parents more and you need to do, so, so um, I, I have, a, I have a lot that I could say. I've, I've really tried to focus in on how we communicate to parents and how I connect individually one-on-one -on -one with parents. But in the context of, of a full parents meeting, I'm still trying to figure that one out a little bit. Um, 
but I have some really good ideas for this year. Maybe we can maybe we can talk about it by by January. I'm really excited to to explain some things and, and go over some stuff with the with the parents this year. Uh, just in in um, yeah, just getting them excited about what we're doing and and, and uh, letting them know that we're bringing them along the way. They're not going to get left behind. And what they do matters. Uh, but yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on that too. It's a tough nut to crack because. Um, parent meetings are getting increasingly smaller as I talk to other kids pastors in our areas and everything where a lot of them aren't even doing kid, uh, parents meetings anymore they do Facebook groups but not everybody's on Facebook um, so yeah that's where we innovate Doreen yep. we do our, right after church yep and they provide lunch yeah we, that, we do a similar sort of thing I order pizza for everybody we do it right after church we provide child care uh, and we try to keep it up to under an hour so yeah, those are all good things. Any other questions? Still can talk about. Yeah, yeah. I so um, I put my email address on the the sheet that I gave you guys is right towards the top. And I one of my favorite things to do in the world is is to meet with with other kids, pastors, other leaders, and have coffee with them or grab lunch. I love to eat. Um, I grew up with Southern cooking, and so I feel loved when I when I feel fed. Uh, that's a problem too. But um, but but seriously, seriously, if any of you guys are in the area, or if I'm in your area, and you want to chat about stuff, or you want to get together and talk about um, anything, anything at all, it can be completely unrelated to this. Uh, please um, please email me, and I'd love to set something up with you guys. Uh, I don't have all the answers figured out. Like I said, a lot of this is innovating and trial and error and creating a culture in your children's ministry where it's okay to fail. We try things all the time. And it's really tough to kind of to kind of even get to that place. But now uh, my team's pretty regular with the understanding of like, hey, we're going to try things a couple of times. We're going to evaluate it. And if it was terrible, like let's talk about how terrible it was and how we can either make it better or just ditch it. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's probably one of the most important things that I would recommend uh, any kids ministry or any ministry at all kind of build in. But yeah, thanks guys for coming out. I think you guys are super. And if there's not anything else, I think uh, we've, we got about 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes until the next session starts off. So, Oh, yes. Yeah, I really appreciate this because, yeah, you know, the Lord's working in all our hearts to see things. And we have a common land mm -hmm. down the way that we're followers and that we're here to water plants. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't pass on the all of the somehow impact people and somehow I come through life thinking, oh God should really mentor anybody. Yeah, there's tremendous pressure. And so it's like I don't know if I can do that. So I kinda of pass it all back at times. And then but he put me in situations where I was in preschool and I was a teenager and in pre preschool school class. And mm -hmm. you just plant a seed and then all of a sudden he tells me, looking back at all the people who've been planting seeds in my life, mm -hmm. it's not like they spent a lot of time yeah, I mean, let's be honest for a second that when I think back in my life and I think about going to Sunday school growing up and the kids leaders that I had, I don't remember a single specific lesson that I learned my entire time growing up. But I remember my leaders. I remembered how much they care. I remember, um, I remember like in general, the themes that I kind of learned growing up because those things are caught while you pick up, not even if you don't remember the specific lesson. And, and so trying to put yourself in a position to be that person um, that just invests in kids and then also hopefully empowers parents. See, the Holy Spirit is in charge of all that. Yep. It's with Him that we minister to mm -hmm. through all these people. Absolutely. That's and that good is word. Yeah. That, that he, he knows yeah. what He's doing, even though, like you were saying, it's all messy. Yep. Like what's been happening with Liv was, it's okay, Liv. Life's messy. Yeah. Look, what are you doing? Yay. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that we didn't talk about is more than the
Yeah, absolutely. One of the, one of the things that, that I wanted to bring up and, and just didn't get the time to so much is uh, setting up the idea of easy wins for parents. Uh, put your parents in a position, and it goes in line with kind of the drop-in kind of practice uh, sort of things. Put your parents in a position where they feel awesome about what they just did. It's an easy win. You set them up for the layup, right? You're the guy who's kind of tossing the ball and make them feel like they're the one who slam dunked it. Uh, and so finding ways to do that within your children's ministry is, is a huge thing, especially for people who are just starting off, especially for people who are young in their faith. Yes. Yeah, I think for churches that can that can pull something like that off, uh, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. I think that's really great. One of the things that we transitioned to uh, about a year and a half ago is we um, we teach our preschoolers once they hit four years old the exact same lesson that our elementary kids learn so that when parents bring them home they ask their kids they have different age kids hey what did you learn in church today they're hearing the same thing across the board and the kids can interact with with each other but the other added benefit to that is it allows us to take you know our third grader out of the elementary program put him or her into the preschool program and they're they're still learning as a matter of fact the best way to learn is by do teaching anyway right uh, and, and so they're teaching kids or they're engaging or interacting with the kids at that level, but they're still learning the same thing they would have been if they were in the class. So I love that idea. I love it. Great. Anything else? Awesome. Well, hey, it's great chatting with you guys. Thanks for putting up with me. And uh, thanks for visiting Seattle. Woo!